Welcome, welcome, welcome to Above Replacement Radio. I am your host, Chris Gianta. I might be becoming a bad baseball fan who can't enjoy the romantic things because of advanced statistics. 15 years from now, I want to be on the early baseball committee. Over there on the other side of the screen is Daniel Curran. I literally have the fan graphs hoodie. The baseball reference t-shirt is repping some stats, you know what I'm saying? It's not necessarily Hall of Fame. It's not necessarily above average, but we can guarantee you we are better than just the standard replacement level college sophomore. And welcome to Above Replacement Radio. We're talking baseball kind of whenever. I'm your host, Christian over there. To my actual left, as you cannot see on YouTube, unfortunately, is Daniel Curran. How you doing, Daniel? Chris, I am doing well today. Uh, it was another fun weekend of baseball. Um, we saw... Masataka Yoshida hit two home runs in the same inning yesterday. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, Eduardo Rodriguez had a perfect game bid to the seventh. Uh, Drew Smiley had a perfect game bid to the eighth. Yeah. That yeah. uh, <laughs> what an ending that that one had to it. Um. Yeah. For sure. For sure. The perfect game bids were were fun, interesting stuff. Um. I was prepared to look up all the all the hard contact outs that were uh, yeah. that were given up yep. on each <laughs> for each perfect game to try and uh you know ruin it but um but yeah no perfect games there was there was uh two home runs in one inning by one player that was cool yeah um but yeah uh one thing that did happen over the weekend was the Chicago White Sox uh got swept uh they have lost. Hey, they've been losing a lot of games overall in the year seven and fifteen. Um, the White Sox were a team I was optimistic about heading into the season. I figured um, new management would really push the team in a direction they weren't going in prior. Um, and I would. I was also relying on some bounce back seasons. So far, we haven't really seen that as they sit with a with a worse record than the uh, Detroit Tigers right now. Yeah. So what are you seeing from the from the White Sox? Well, the White Sox problems, y- you got to go a lot deeper than just like, oh, the weighted runs created plus the ERA because this is a batted ball problem for the Chicago White Sox. The White Sox have the lowest average launch angle in the majors uh, at 8.9 degrees. They have the second highest ground ball rate from their hitters at 48.4%. They're only 0.1 uh, behind the Miami Marlins for the for the top spot on the on the uh, highest ground ball rate, and they also have the low the third lowest exit velocity. I believe they have the third lowest exit velocity behind the Rockies and Nationals. Um, this this offense is too high powered to be performing like this. They also have a 299 team OBP, uh, which is the third worst behind the Royals and Tigers. Uh, um, wow, amazingly, the the bottom four OBPs in the league are all in the AL Central. It goes Royals, Tigers, White Sox, Twins. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Cleveland's like probably middle of the pack. Anyway, I digress. Uh, the White Sox, their their big issue has been they're not hitting very well from a specifically from an analytical standpoint. Um, there's really no way around that. Yeah, uh yeah, batted pro- batted ball profile not looking great from an offensive standpoint. Um and uh and yeah, like you know that this is an offense. Two years ago, uh, we looked at this offense as one of the best in baseball. You know, powered by Tim Anderson, who's currently on the IL right now, unfortunately. But you know, Yasmani Grandal, Eloy Jimenez, Luis Robert, um, among others, uh, Jose Abreu at the time, and now guys like Andrew Vaughn and Jake Berger, who Berger's actually doing really well. Um, but we, we regarded this as one of the better lineups in baseball, and and last year they took a step down, and it looks like they haven't quite bounced back uh, quite yet. Yeah, no, they haven't. Um, I'm, I'm looking at this right now. I believe they keep putting Luis Robert as the leadoff guy in the lineup, and Luis Robert has a 250 OBP this year. Yeah, that's yeah, like, interesting. He, Luis Robert is a very good power hitter, he shouldn't be leading off the, for the White Sox. Right. I know he's batting second. They haven't batted second, which is still honestly kind of holds the same truth. Right. Yeah. If you if you're yeah, if a to... if a guy has like a higher ISO but lower on base percentage, usually that's someone who uh, gets put like sixth in the lineup or something like that. Yeah. The they... White Sox. Sorry. They also have one of the lowest walk rates. They have the third lowest walk rate 
uh, among on their hitters behind only or in front of only the Diamondbacks and Royals. Yeah, explains the OBP a little bit more. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, with with Robert too, I I would imagine they're putting him at the top of the lineup because they know about his speed, and mm-hmm. they want a faster guy at the top of the lineup. But if you're only getting on base twenty five percent of the time, you know the, it's your speed is a little less valuable because you're not even on those bases to steal bases. Um, so yeah, but you know, there, I feel, I feel like, especially with some of the guys in the IL right now, I think Moncada is also on the IL. There aren't yeah. too many options. No, there aren't. Uh, their pitching staff has also allowed the second lowest ground ball rate in the majors at 38.5%. The only team that is a lower one is the Oakland athletics who have given mm. up like a thousand home runs this year. Uh, the White Sox have the fourth highest fly ball rate against behind the A's, Angels, and Blue Jays uh, at 28.1%. They're actually tied with the Rangers for fourth. Uh, yeah, analytically, this is not an aesthetically pleasing team. They're hitting a lot of ground balls. They're not giving up a lot of ground balls. They're giving up a lot of hard contact. They're not hitting very hard. They're not walking a lot. There, this, There's a lot of... there. It's almost like... Uh, what people want, like the Guardians, to be when they play like the old school style of baseball is like yeah. what the White Sox are. Yeah, <laughs> they're they're hitting a lot of ground balls with not a lot of speedy players besides like Luis Robert. Yeah, and I mean even their power guys are not you know are hitting the ball on the ground a lot. Like Eloy Jimenez, for instance, is a guy with a ton of power, a guy with thirty home run potential if he stays healthy. He has a fifty one point four percent ground ball rate this year. Yeah. That's you can't be you can't be doing that. Yeah, league average is usually 41. around forty one. For league, league average this year is forty. Oh no, it's forty four. Sorry. Yeah, forty four, forty five percent usually um, is where it's at. Uh, <clears throat> as far as the White Sox go, so yeah, analytically, definitely not looking great. Um, but just if you go based off of you know results and what they have to look forward to uh and whatnot i think it's not it's not necessarily that that they've had a hard schedule but they've had a schedule that's harder than what your average american league central team will look at yeah uh so they've so they haven't won a series yet this year we should add uh they're 7 and 15 every series they've played has either been a split or a loss they have not won back-to-back games i believe um oh wow that's, yeah that's pretty wild um so yeah their best series was the opening series where they split with houston but yeah they've lost series to the orioles twins phillies pirates giants and rays um but yeah five of the seven teams they faced were 500 or better last year and then the other two were the twins who you know are they're they're all right, they they weren't far off from 500 last year, and then the team besides that was the uh, Pirates, who are just randomly hot. Like they probably just caught them at the wrong time. Um, and yeah, what should be noted with the White Sox also is they don't face the they don't face the uh, the Tigers until or they don't face the Royals until May 8th, and then they don't face the Tigers till May 25th. Great day. Uh, uh, great, wonderful day. <laughs> um, but, you know, they don't face those bottom-of-the-barrel AL Central teams uh, for, for a little bit, and it the hard stretch continues when they face Toronto for three games and then Tampa Bay again right after, um, and then Minnesota right after that. But, you know, I think from May 8th on, things should get a little bit easier. Uh, granted, you know, Division games are not as par- as prominent as they were before this year, just league-wide. You know, it's 14 games as opposed to 18 or 19. But I think, you know, there's potential catching up they can do when they reach those bottom-of-the-barrel AL Central teams because they've only faced uh, – they've only had three AL Central games thus far this year, which is still very low. Yeah, and they've been, what, against the Twins, who are, yeah. like, an actually good team, yeah. team that is leading the division currently. Mm-hmm. Not by a ton. Uh, the White Sox also have the second worst chase rate in the league. They are at thirty three point nine percent behind only the Kansas City Royals uh, mm-hmm. for that top spot. 
they're there i mean i could go on and on but i think you get it at this point they're you know this is not a good team analytically they're doing everything like the white Sox should be proof that you need to play analytical ball to win in 2023 because this is a team that has talent even with the even with the subtractions they've had due to injury and losing jose Abreu in the offseason this is a team that should be much better than 7 and 15 in a relatively weak division right um but there, there's a lot of things, especially on the hitting side, that need to be taken care of. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Um, and yeah, the only, the only uh, things I can point to with opponents, uh, you know, kind of reversing what they would do analytically in terms of ground ball rate was they face the Giants, who have, who always, I think for the past three years have been like the leaders in ground ball rate. But that's the only team I can really point to that would kind of throw the yeah. White Sox off like that. Because, yeah, you know, the Giants have, you know, Webb and Cobb and Alex Wood, most notably, are real ground ball guys. But I can't really think of any other team that would necessarily throw the White Sox off like that. So they definitely have to fix some things up over yeah, there on no the doubt. south side. Um, yeah, 7-15, and 15, not great. Um, and they got Toronto, Tampa Bay, Minnesota, and then they have a little bit of a a little bit of an easy stretch on the road, however, against Cincinnati and then Kansas City. So, yeah, we'll see. We'll see where they're at in a, in a month or so. It might be around the same. Who knows? Um, I wonder uh, how short the leash is with Pedro Griefall right now. I can't imagine it's too short. I mean, it is only a 22-game stretch, but certainly I think, you know, it's floating around the mines. has to be, right? Yeah, I I wonder, I wonder for sure. I think, I think um, if if they lose the games that they're really really supposed to win, mm-hmm. that leash will will get shorter and shorter. Yeah, like you mentioned, they have the Blue Jays coming up this week. So I mean, you know, the schedule doesn't give them too many favors at this point. Yeah, especially you know after having just faced the Rays. Um. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. 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 Catch. You know, they caught. Yeah, they definitely caught the Rays at the wrong time. Caught the Pirates at the wrong time, and. Um, sort of caught the Orioles at the wrong time. They're doing really well. We're going to talk about them soon. Um, so, you know, maybe it's a, maybe it's sort of bad luck with the schedule, but obviously, as you mentioned, um, there's some things that they're doing wrong straight up. Um, so they got to, they got to work on that. Um, so yeah, as we mentioned, one of the teams that they lost a series to was the Orioles and the Orioles right now are 14 and seven. Um, yes, they are. They're fourteen and seven. If not for the Rays, just you know, absolutely being a heat-seeking missile of a team, <laughs> yep. they'd probably be leading the division. Um, and yeah, this is a yeah. The Orioles. What have you been thinking about the Orioles and their uh, in their play so far? They've been kind of, in some ways, anti White Sox. They've been playing you know the good kind of baseball. They have the second highest walk rate in the majors, only behind the L.A. Dodgers. Um, you know, they have a 170 ISO, which is above the average. I don't know where it ranks specifically, but it's definitely, it's, uh, 10th, 10th in the league, uh, which is pretty crazy considering they obviously play in that ballpark where they make it tough to, to hit a home runs. Ironically, their defense does not look, uh, too good analytically, but, uh, you know, it's been working for them. They have a BABIP against of, uh, a 291, which is probably around league average. Yeah. Or sorry, that is a BABIP of 291. A BABIP against of uh, 298. Yeah, so that's still around league average. I think the league average BABIP right now is 296, 297 or something. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, both both ways around average. Um. They're definitely beating up on the teams they should be beating up on, which, you know, that's a skill in itself for sure. Um. That's what good teams do. And... Yeah, it's a uh, yeah. It, you could you could look at the Orioles in a in a lot of d- directions for context and for the context in which we looked at them prior to the season starting was a team that kind of arrived early last year that's due for some a, a little slight regression mm-hmm. despite you know having a full season of Adley Rutschman and and Gunnar Henderson you know there was expected slight regression so far we haven't seen that um, I guess the one. Uh, the one flaw you could point to is they've had two division series and they've they've lost both of them. 
um, they've lost to the Red Sox and the Yankees. Um, and the Red Sox aren't necessarily... And a, those are arguably not even the two best teams in the division. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, you could definitely argue Besides that. Besides them, of course. Right, 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 right. Um, so, <clears throat> so yeah, that that's one thing you could point out. But, again, they're beating the teams they're supposed to. They swept the Tigers. They uh, took two in a two-game set against the Nationals. Maybe there was a rain out. I'm not quite sure. Uh, they took two out of three from the Rangers and they took three out of four from the from the Athletics and two out of three from the White Sox who we expected to be doing a little bit better yeah um and uh I would imagine I know their Pythagorean win loss is a little off I imagine their bullpen has been doing fairly well but I could be wrong about that um I mean Felix Batista gave up a home run in his second outing and ever since then he's been a monster um he's just been insane their bullpen has this has is tied for the best uh f4 in the league with the pittsburgh pirates another yeah. team that's been really uh popping off right this year right absolutely um yeah that bullpen it looks like has a 3.12 era which uh ranks fifth in baseball and that fip probably uh, that 3.21 fip probably ranks a little bit better um, but Fangraphs, unfortunately, always, no matter what, has descending order Yeah. to start. Yeah, uh, Baltimore, third best FIP in baseball, and they have a, a good amount of bullpen innings, too. So that means that means a good amount. And that, that was probably the Orioles' biggest strength last year was their bullpen. Um, they were a top 10 bullpen in all of baseball last year. I figured that would regress a little bit, but so far, uh, so far it's looking good, and it's obviously keeping them in games because – Pythagorean has them projected uh, twelve and nine, but yep. they've already won two more games than their projected Pythagorean. I don't I, at this point. I don't really know, uh, you know, what the the um, climate will be on the trade market in a few months. But I mean, the rotation is probably the biggest thing that is to be desired for the Orioles. Mm-hmm. What if the White Sox are sellers? Um, the team that we just talked about. I mean, what if Lance Lynn goes on the market? What if Lucas Giolito even goes on the market? Yeah. Uh, Dylan Cease, I think, is probably staying. He's, right. He's too young. Uh, yeah, he's he's uh, he has two more years of control left after this year. Because I think, mistaken. I mean, I think the one kind of consensus thing that we can agree on is that the Orioles don't really have an ace. Uh, you know, they don't yeah. have that guy that it's like, you, you know, he's going to lock it down every single time. Yeah, and I, I'd argue they don't even have a number two guy. Yeah, you could probably argue that one as well. Um, um, for now, I mean, if someone could emerge, you know, yeah, if they have, Gray it just hasn't been a sample size yet. Gray Rod's been looking good, but you know, he's yeah. he's very young and and yeah. uh, has room to grow for sure. No, but he's definitely been showing plenty of signs of strength in his first, yes. you know, couple starts. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. Like the strikeout numbers are there. Uh, just the walk and home run numbers. Actually, the home run numbers are decent. Yeah, uh, but the walk numbers and the you know just the um, bibbippery could could help itself out a little bit more, for sure. Yeah, that could uh, that could definitely happen. Um, I think also with this, we're seeing the value of Al- of Adley Rutschman. Yeah, um, who just really, it's really amazing with Adley Rutschman is like, oh, he's uh you know. Drafted number one, okay. Uh, now he's going to be a top five prospect for uh, until he arrives at the big leagues, and then, okay, he's going to arrive at the big leagues. He might have a weird couple weeks, and then he's going to adjust perfectly, and then he's going to finish. And then he's run- going to yeah finish, change the entire team. Then he's going to finish r- runner up and rookie of the year, and probably if he played a full season, maybe yeah, all, yeah, with only 113 games played. Yeah, if he played a full season, maybe would have won that rookie of the year, and then. Uh, He's going to be a full-on MVP candidate for 2023. That's what it looks like. Yeah, I mean, I'm not only that, but I mean, I what's the I gotta check. So Adley came up on what day? Um, last year it was it late was May late, or late early May. June. Uh, his it debut was May 21st. What was the Orioles' record last year from May 21st on? Actually, let me just check the uh, overall. Yeah, it. I know they they were probably like eight games below 500 at one point last year. Or maybe even worse than that. Um, so the team, the team really definitely just got a lot better. You know, for more reasons than Adley Rutschman, but Rutschman was definitely probably the biggest factor. Yep. 
um, that an individual could have on that team. Yeah, I mean, there's seven games over 500 at this point. That's probably... Were they ever seven games over 500 last year? Did they finish seven games over 500? I'm sure at one point in, like, August, they hit that point. Uh, okay, so real quick, the Orioles are 81-62 and 62 since Adley came up last year yeah. overall. Yeah. Uh, that's that's pretty crazy. Yeah, and that's with, like, a a bottom, like, like that is a payroll. Yeah, that is a 90-plus win pace, right? Um. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's nineteen games. It would be nineteen games left. Yeah, and you're over five hundred. Yeah, it would. It would. Eighty one divided by one forty three times one sixty two is ninety two wins. Yeah. Yeah. Ninety two in pace for a team that won fifty two games in twenty twenty one. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So. And didn't really make a ton of like external additions. No. Yeah. They didn't. They didn't go on a Rangers rampage and sign three key big free agents they've just had some guys come up some guys step up and uh and yeah so far it means a 14 and 7 record um i know they face the red sox uh this upcoming weekend or this upcoming week yeah not weekend um this upcoming week that's one of the two teams that they've lost a series against then after that it's Detroit again, and then after that, it's Kansas City. Yeah. So they're they're facing Detroit and Kansas City before the White Sox are, uh, un- unfortunately for the White Sox. Then Braves, Rays, Pirates. Yeah, I don't know. The schedule is Braves, getting... Braves, Rays, Pirates. Now, those are three great teams. Yeah, I mean those are t- those are two those are all teams that are like around first place in their respective the, divisions. The the top five teams in the league by record are so funny right now. Yeah, because it's it's Tampa, like Baltimore, Pittsburgh, Texas, and Milwaukee, or something like that. Yeah, let me I, let me check the actual. Yeah, I don't know the. I just know the twenty twenty one Royals have have uh, yeah, like made me scarred you. <laughs> they have made me skeptical on all hot starts from mm-hmm. odd teams. <laughs> um so the the top 5 records, yeah, exactly. Are Tampa Bay, Pittsburgh, Milwaukee, Baltimore, Atlanta or Atlanta, Texas, Atlanta 6th. Yeah, wow. Um yeah, so that's pretty cool. Pirates <laughs> Pirates are pretty cool. They're fun. We will uh yeah, they're they're definitely fun. Good lineup. Um and yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they do uh moving forward here. But yeah, anything uh anything more on the Orioles before we get into uh, players to highlight? No, I think that was all I had on them, honestly. All right. Well, you know, those are uh those are that's one team that's been specifically underperforming and one uh team that has been exceeding expectations. Exceeding expectations um in a in a really tough division. And luckily for them, you know, the amount of games you have to play in a division has gone from 72 to 56 games. Um, so, you know, maybe getting a playoff spot would be easier than normal for an AL East team. And for an AL Central team, it would be a little harder than normal because of their uh, weak division. Yes. But uh, now we move on to players or subjects that have been that have uh, been catching our eye for good or bad reasons. We'll start with the good for our... Monday, April 24, 2023 edition of... How about that? Um, who do you have for us today? So for the first time in 2023, I went reliever diving Ooh. for my how about that. I went with Andrew Wants of the Los Angeles Angels. In 10 innings pitched, he has yet to allow a run, and he has allowed three hits. He has struck out 10, and he has walked one. Uh, this places him third among all relievers in F4 to start this season at .5. Uh, he is an average exit velocity against of 81.3 miles per hour, putting him in the 99th percentile. He is also in the top 10 percentile in expected ERA slash expected WOBA, expected batting average, walk rate, and fastball spin rate. So Andrew Wants has been doing a lot of different things uh to prove how to prove how good he's been this year, thirty four point eight percent of his batted balls have been minus forty degrees or lower, or sixty five degrees or higher. Thirty four point eight percent of his his batted balls. That's the highest rate among the four hundred ninety one pitchers that have pitched in twenty twenty three. No qualifier. 
no you know set number of batted balls allowed anyone who's pitched 34.8 percent is the highest so what that says is that his ground balls are the groundiest of balls and his pop-ups go way up there yeah essentially um on that same list of 491, his ground balls have the second lowest average launch angle at minus 40.8 degrees, and his ground balls also have uh, an average exit velocity of 68.3%. That is the second lowest in the majors. 17.4% of his batted balls have been considered weak contact uh, by Savant, and that is the fifth highest rate among the 361 qualifiers. Uh, my one of my favorite things about April is waiting like two weeks into the season to see like which like random relievers have just been popping off, and none of them stand out more than Andrew Wants. Yeah, Andrew. Uh, <clears throat> Andrew Wants. How about that? How about that? Uh, yeah, looking really good. Angels reliever. Angels reliever. Yeah, so that checks another team off the list. I am staying in the AL West for my how about that. Um, and this is someone who just, he's just been really, he's been doing everything really well the past 11 games. And I'm talking about Jonah Heim, uh, in, in his last 11 games, he is hitting 378 with a 1246 OPS and a 240 weighted runs created plus in the span out of 184 qualifiers, his average ranks sixth on base percentage ranks fifth slugging ranks sixth OPS ranks third and weighted runs created plus ranks second out of 184 out of 214 batters with 25 plus batted balls in the span his expected batting average ranks first his expected woba ranks second and his expected slugging ranks fourth uh, along with that in the span jonah heim has a 94.7 mile per hour average exit velocity 60.0 percent hard hit rate and 20.0 percent barrel rate the average exit velocity ranks 12th out of 214 hard hit rate ranks uh, tied for ninth and barrel rate ranks tied for 14th. Um, Heim has also just been hitting the ball not only hard, but in the correct direction. Only eight of the 30 batted balls he's hit in this span have been ground balls, and his 26.7% ground ball rate is 12th lowest in this span. And uh, just 70%. 70% of the batted balls he's hit have been fly balls or line drives, and that is the sixth highest rate out of 214. So not only does he have only eight ground balls out of 30 batted balls, he, only, he also only has one pop-up. Uh, so he's doing really well in that department. Uh, Jonah Heim also has had great plate discipline. His 17.0% walk rate ranks 14th out of 184 in the span, and his 1.00 walk-to-strikeout ratio ranks 18th. He has a 17.0% walk rate and a 17.0% strikeout rate in this 11-game span. And his 22.0% chase rate in this span ranks 27th lowest out of 120 hitters to see 100-plus pitches out of the zone. So with Jonah Heim, he's hitting the ball extremely hard. He's hitting the ball He's hitting the ball in the correct direction, line drives and fly balls pretty much exclusively at 70%. And uh, he's also seeing the ball really well. He's not chasing pitches. He's also not swinging and missing at pitches and getting strikeouts. Just everything is really going well for this guy. He's a catcher for the uh, for the Texas Rangers. Probably gets more DH time as he gets better. And uh, you know, according to Weighted Runs, Weighted Runs Created Plus has been the second best hitter in baseball um, in the last eleven games. So Jonah Heim. How about that? Um. All right, so now we go from the highs to the lows where we're talking players to subjects that have been, that have been underperforming for our, for our Monday, April 24, 2023 edition of... Slightly alarming. Um, who do you have for us today? So for this one, I've, I've watched this entire span play out in real time. Uh, I'm talking about Manny Machado, uh, mm. who has been very disappointing to start this year. He had a quote recently where he said, "Like, don't you know, don't get on the bandwagon when we start raking." And that was about the whole team, but also definitely about him specifically because he is currently slashing 220, 250, 286 for a 536 weight or OPS and a 49 weighted runs created plus. That 49 weighted runs created plus is the ninth worst in Major League Baseball, and. 
it's you know, other than defense, it's very hard to find something that he's doing well. He currently has a 4.2% walk rate, which is his worst since 2013. He has a strikeout rate of 22.9%, which is the worst of his career. He is suffering the lowest average exit velocity in any season since exit velocity began uh, being tracked in 2015. He is currently at 88.6 miles per hour. He's never had an exit velocity below 90. He also has a 48.6% uh Wow, I just I just put he has a 48.6% and didn't put anything else, but I know what it is. It's his ground ball rate. Mm-hmm. He has a 48.6% ground ball rate, the highest of his career. He has a 20% line drive rate, which is the lowest of his career. He had a 29% line drive rate last year, which is a large part of the reason why he had such a good year, was an MVP finalist, and eventually, you know, got extended. Uh after already having having received a big contract, but he has a 20% line drive rate this year, the worst of his career. He also has a 28.6% sweet spot rating, which is his worst since 2015. He has a hard hit rate of 32.9%, which is, uh, by the way, this is his first season being below 40% in such a thing, and he's at 32.9%. Uh, his outside swing percent is at 36.4%, the highest of his career, and lastly, his zone contact rate is at 81.5%, the lowest of his career. Uh, right now, Manny Machado is having the worst season of his career, and it's not even particularly close. Obviously, it's only been a month, and he can certainly turn things around, but he's got a lot to turn around right now. Yeah, uh, Manny Machado. Slightly alarming. Um, yeah, not, uh, not starting out well. Um, I know the Padres have been kind of treading water. Um, not breaking out quite yet like many predicted yeah i mean pachado's been struggling soto's been struggling yeah luckily for them though no one in the nl west has really broken out quite yet except for the diamondbacks well, th- yeah but even but even that, then they're, they're you know barely 11 over, yeah. i think yeah i mean if they had the pirates record it'd be a little different but right. they don't yeah i think the dodgers are fluttering around 500 um and then yeah the rockies just being rockies and the giants have stunk yeah um so that's not great for them. Yeah, Rockies have the worst defense in the league. Um, yeah. That's above average wise. Yeah, I think that even even in the thin air, they can't they can't jump and dive the way <laughs> <laughs> the way they should. Um, all right. So my slightly alarming. Um, it, probably, if he didn't have the year he had last year, would not qualify as a slightly alarming because. Maybe he's just retracting to what he was before last year, um, but I'm talking about Brandon Drury, who last year, you know, he was a impact guy for the Reds before uh, being traded to the Padres and being an impact guy there. Um, you know, had a 122 OPS plus last year, even though he played a lot of games in Great American Ballpark, was still able to be 22% above league average offensively um, with park factors too. Um, However, this year, Brandon Drury, after signing a two-year deal with the Angels, uh, in 72 plate appearances this year, he's hitting 179 with a 477 OPS. Uh, His strikeout rate is 31.9%, and his walk rate is 2.8%. He has an expected WOBA in the 4th percentile in all of baseball, a whiff rate in the 21st percentile in all of baseball, and a chase rate in the 6th percentile. Um, from 2022 to 2023 so far, Brandon Drury's riff, whiff rate uh, has gone from 22% to 31%. Zone contact rate has gone from 86% to 75%. Chase rate has gone from 30% to 40%. Uh, and against four seams fastballs specifically, which is a pitch with a league whiff rate that's below average, uh, Brandon Drury has a 38.6% whiff rate against four seamers. Out of 279 hitters to swing at 25 or more four-seamers, his whiff rate against them is the 16th highest, which is the highest 6% whiff rate on four-seam fastballs. Um, So, yeah, not doing well. Sub-500 OPS so far this season. Um, One of the worst in the league. And, uh, and yeah, maybe it's him just having a bad 20 games, or maybe this is just him reverting back to what he was uh, before 2022. So... We'll uh, we'll figure that out as time goes along. But so far, Brandon Drury. Slightly alarming. Um, all right, that does it for players to highlight. Um, That's also a talk of shame for me. Oh uh, yeah, a talk of shame, indirect talk of shame. Yeah. Um, 
You're doing it for me. I yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, is is a uh, residential. Uh, you're the residential angels optimist. I'm the residential angels. I'm the I'm the residential. I I just want to speak it into existence for the angels. Yeah, you want to. Ma- he, he's the angels manifester. Yeah. Um. I'm. I don't know if you'd call me a angels pessimist or realist, but I think time. time I think both are fair. Both can be fair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. But uh. But yeah. So I have Brandon Dury as a slightly alarming. Um. The Angels right now are, I think, a game over five hundred. Uh, they're at or they're five, at five hundred. Yeah, 500. they are eleven and eleven. Yeah, they had an awful loss on Saturday night to the Royals. I watched that one. Uh, the whole thing transpired. Matt Thice hit a go-ahead two-run home run in the eighth, and mm. it was a cool moment. And then Jose Quijada came in and was like, "I'm going to give up five runs this inning." Yeah, yeah. I'm going to hit two batters. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Not that it was it was pretty bad. Not that we need to make this sub- a subject, but I was just thinking about the Royals and like we so we I saw your tweet yesterday. Yeah, I saw like I put it out there. I know so I know I I've already put this out there. But like so the Royals I just noticed were the worst had the worst record in the league and we we've already talked about the Tigers being bad Besides this the A's. year. Yeah. Yeah, worst record in uh worst record in the AL Central. Yeah, this entire season has just been roasting the AL Central. Yeah. We've already talked about the Tigers, but, like, I feel like the Royals just don't get hated on enough. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I, the tweet was, like, if if the A's and Astros don't blow four-run leads in clinchers, we're looking at this team as a di- disaster franchise. They've made the yeah. playoffs twice since 1985, and uh, it just happened that they were able to win a World Series one of those times. Win a World Series and also go to a World Series and yeah. like be ninety feet away from tying up Game Seven in the yeah. ninth. But but af- but besides like, that, we could very realistically also be living in a timeline where they just randomly won back to back World Series out of nowhere. True. Right. Yeah. That's a <laughs> that's a funny thing. It's like the the nineties Blue Jays or something. Yeah. 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 Except I think they made the playoffs in the eighties a little bit. The Blue Jays did. But like, yeah, the Royals, they just. Ran, they they were just horrible for a long time. Then they made the playoffs. They made the playoffs via the s- via wild card. Yeah, snuck into the playoffs. Uh, beat the A's, who were favored and ended up having a seven to three lead in, into the eighth inning of that game. Uh, beat them. Uh, then went to the World Series. Took the Giants to a seventh game, um, and almost won that game. And then go to the go to the. Win the division next year for the first mm-hmm. time since 1985. Also have the best record in the AL. Yeah. Um, yeah, best record in the AL. But like, but first time in 30 years they had won the division. And they almost lose to the Astros, but then they win the World Series. And then ever since then, they've they've been completely irrelevant. Yeah, I mean, you also have to consider how like the legacy of that World Series and that team because a lot of people look at that as like, Oh yeah, that team shouldn't even have won. They weren't even that good. It's not true. They were very good. Yeah. But they played a very you know uh, non traditional at the time style of baseball. A style that's kind of going uh, endangered at this point, as you say. Yeah. Um, and also, you got to consider the other teams that tried to replicate that model. The the most egregious and failure like example was the Colorado Rockies. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, they built the Super Bowl pen. Yeah. If you remember, they had like the most expensive bullpen in history in like 2017, 18 or whatever year yeah. it was. It was like Holland, Davis, and Shaw or something. Yeah. They they paid a lot of money for Wade Davis, Brian Shaw. Yeah. And it was a it was an absolute disaster. Right. Uh, yeah, if it wasn't for the A's and Astros blowing those leads, the Rockies might never have spent $70 million on a bullpen. Yeah. Butterfly effect. Yep. Butterfly effect. But yeah, I just found that funny because, cause yeah, like they... The Royals just were dormant for 29 years, mm-hmm. then were very relevant in baseball, and then went right back into irrelevancy. Yeah, and, and not only that, but like I've said this before on this show, but I don't really see the light at the end of the tunnel for them. Yeah, no, like they. Like for the Tigers, I can kind of see it. Mm-hmm. You know, like I have to look very closely to see it, but yeah, I can, you know, there's something there. And just like from a front office standpoint, the Royals have always been a low payroll team. They're one of, I think, seven teams right now with a sub one hundred million dollar payroll, and like a quarter of that payroll is going to 
an overrated catcher that <laughs> probably just they probably just signed that deal for fan service. Well, they, well, they realized he had the he has the the championship tattoo on his. Yeah, <laughs> I forget where on his body it is, but it's like, well, we can't just we can't let him play for another team now. Like yeah. he basically already committed. Yeah, no, we <laughs> can't just go to the Mets now yeah, no. <laughs> and play for them. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It was just it was just something I randomly thought of because I just saw their horrible record this year and the fact that it probably won't change too much over the next few years. No, unless Bobby Witt Jr. turns into like a twelve win player, but. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, he just turns into the the best player post bonds. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Even then, um, but yeah, that was just a random thought. But now we can get into a preview of the week ahead. Uh, I will be highlighting some series to look out for. You know, good uh, good team matchups. Daniel will be looking at the day by day pitching matchups. Um, as far as series to watch. Um, it's the uh, it's the series we all knew we would want to watch uh, at this point in the year. It's the Pirates and the Dodgers. Yeah. Uh, two of the best teams in the National League going at it uh, with the Pirates hosting the Dodgers. I mean, when when was the last time this would have been this imagine uh, yeah, this imagine uh, imagine 2013 if the Pirates if the Pirates won that NLDS against the Cardinals, they would have faced oh, the Dodgers. Dude, they were one win away. Yeah, yeah. Twice, I think, they were one win away. They were up 2-1 in that series. Freaking Marlon Bird out, up there hitting home runs Yeah. after hitting zero with the Red Sox the year before. Yeah, there was definitely something going on there. Um, then uh, another series to watch, two of the actual best teams in the AL uh, would be Rays Astros. Uh, Rays are red hot. Um, Astros sort of been treading water so far, um, but I'm sure they would they will put up a good competition with the Rays, and uh, and yeah, that's that's mostly what I got. Um, also, an, uh, another another fun series interleague play we don't usually see is uh, Phillies Mariners. That would be a interesting yeah. competition. A lot of stars out there. I don't know how I feel about the balanced schedule this year because like. It is cool to see, like, Phillies Mariners, but it's, like, I don't know, it feels, like, too much that it's, like, every week it's, like, oh, my God, this is a weird matchup. Yeah, no, it's it's Because there's, mul- there's multiple of them every week. Like, it's, you know, we have Rockies Guardians this week. Like, right. what? I just know naturally. We have Rangers Reds. Naturally, I sort of detract, I, I sort of uh, am, you know, disgruntled at change at first. Unless yeah. Unless it's, like, the pitch clock or what or whatever. I'm I'm usually sort of disgruntled that change at first. I remember when the wild card game was introduced. I hated that, and then I turned out to love it. Um, expanded like the twelve team expanded playoffs. I probably didn't like it at first, but I think I'm okay with it now. Yeah. Um, this I'm also kind of disgruntled with at first. Uh, I I think having eighteen, which was eleven percent of games, be interleague. Yeah. Um. I thought I thought that was cool because it was obscure enough to where yeah you kind of had your separation of leagues, but at this point like, you know it could be like the NFL or, uh, yeah NBA especially where, as, like you don't really need league MVPs because everybody's facing each other. Especially because like it takes away from divisional games. Yeah, it's like oh there's not as many Red Sox Yankees games anymore because the Red Sox have to face the Reds this year and right. the Yankees have to face the Giants. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it takes away from that. However, I think it does make things maybe a little more fair. Yeah. Uh, um, for the record, I will never advocate for less league MVPs, um, because, I mean, you know, you know them checks be hidden. Yeah, for, no. For the league MVPs, and I'm for all four players getting paid. Oh yeah. Well, for for the players' sake, yes. Yeah. For, but like from just a general perspective, if if that never if that didn't have a factor on finances and whatnot i'd i'd be more invested in maybe changing that but yeah no for the player's sake definitely keep that around um but yeah it's it's uh it is weird um but yeah i'll i'm you know maybe i'll get used to it maybe i won't uh what do you got for the day by day pitching matchups so on monday today we have chris sale versus dean kramer chris sale had his best outing in years his last time out against minnesota um, in Astros Rays, you have Jose Arquiti versus 
Taj Bradley. Taj Bradley looked awesome in his last time out against the Reds. You have Lance Lynn versus Chris Bassett in the opener of White Sox Blue Jays in Toronto. Edward Cabrera versus Spencer Strider. There's going to be some electric stuff in that matchup on both sides. That's going to be fun. Uh, Johnny Brito, who got lit up against the Twins last start uh, after having two excellent starts, will be going against the Twins again. And it'll be Sonny Gray going for Minnesota. He's been awesome this year. Uh, in A's Angels, it'll be Ken Waldachuk versus Jose Suarez, a couple of lefties. In uh, Cardinals Giants, it's Jordan Montgomery versus Alex Cobb. And matchup of the night comes from Rangers Reds. It's going to be Nathan Ovaldi versus Nick Lodolo. Yeah, that's a couple of couple of guys with good stuff. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, Lodolo really started out hot. Absolutely. Uh, um, what do you got for the next day? On Tuesday, I got in uh, Dodgers Pirates. You have Noah Syndergaard versus Johan Oviedo. Oviedo had a really bad first inning of the year that we saw, and ever since then he's been lights out. Yeah. Uh, in Rangers Reds, Martin Perez will be going for Texas. Logan Gilbert and Bailey Falter will be facing each other in Mariners Phillies. Uh, Jose Barrios will be facing the White Sox for the Blue Jays. Josiah Gray will be facing the Mets for the Nationals at City Field. Charlie Martin will be facing the Marlins for the Braves in Truist Park. Uh, Blake Snell, you already know what you're getting out of him. He'll be facing Justin Steele. Blake Snell is facing is like reaching like peak meme hood in baseball right now. He really is because every single start is the exact same. It's like five innings pitched, a hundred pitches thrown, like six strikeouts, four walks, yeah. two earned runs. Yeah, yeah, dude, it's 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 incredible. Anyway, Blake Snell versus Justin Steele in Padres Cubs at Wrigley. Nestor Cortez versus Joe Ryan at at uh, Minnesota and Yankees Twins. That'll be fun. Spencer Turnbull versus Eric Lauer in Tigers Brewers in Milwaukee. Mason Miller will be facing the Angels for the A's. If you don't know who Mason Miller is, you should check him out. He's a uh, an A's prospect and he looks very good. Uh, in Royals Diamondbacks, it'll be Brady Singer versus Ryan Nelson. And the matchup of the night comes from Rays and Astros in Tampa. It's going to be Luis Garcia versus Drew Rasmussen. Luis Garcia and Drew Rasmussen. Yeah, that's that's. Those are some guys. Those are some guys. <laughs> they are guys for sure. Um, in Red Sox Orioles on Wednesday, Tyler Wells will be going for the Orioles. He's looked pretty decent this year. Um, you will have the who will give up more home runs competition in White Sox Blue Jays. It'll be Michael Kopech versus Yusei Kikuchi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe the White Sox will keep it off the ground that game. <laughs> um, in Yankees Twins, you will have Domingo Herman versus Kenta Maeda. Um, in uh, Tigers Brewers, it'll be Michael Lorenzen versus Freddie Peralta. Zach Gallen will be going for the Diamondbacks against the Royals at Chase Field. Ronzi Contreras will be going for the Pirates against the Dodgers. You have Hunter Brown going for the Astros against the Rays. Marco Gonzalez and Taiwan Walker will be facing each other in Mariners Phillies. Mackenzie Gore and Kodai Senga will face each other in Nats Mets. Sandy Alcantara will come back. He missed his last start. He'll face the Braves uh, at Truist Park. Michael Waka and Drew Smiley will face each other in Padres Cubs. Uh, Patrick Sandoval will be facing the A's for the Angels. And a matchup of the day, of the afternoon, also comes from Rangers Reds. I'm going back to it. It's going to be John Gray versus Graham Ashcraft. Interesting. Yeah. I saw a report this weekend that the Reds were looking to extend Graham Ashcraft, which I'm assuming means they're probably also talking to Nick Lodolo. I mean, they already extended Hunter Green. They're allegedly talking to Graham Ashcraft. I don't see why they're not talking to Nick Lodolo at that point. Yeah, right, because Lodolo is so far what we've seen better. Oh, than... for sure. I mean, Ashcraft throws 100. Um, he's interesting, for sure. Anyway, on Thursday, obviously not too much is announced. Um, Kyle Wright will be facing the Braves for the Marlins at Truist Park. Mitch Keller will be facing the Dodgers for the Pirates in the last game of that series. George Kirby and Matt Strom will be facing each other in Mariners Phillies. Logan Webb will be facing the Cardinals for the Giants. Shohei Otani will be facing the A's for the Angels. Trevor Williams and Joey Lucchesi will be facing each other in Nationals Mets. Uh, and matchup of the day for now, uh, I'm going to go with a Padres Cubs matchup. Seth Lugo versus Hayden Wesneski. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you got a guy who's been historically a 
good reliever versus yeah. a guy who uh, was projected out. to be a reliever at the beginning of the year. Yeah, yeah. At, I'm looking at Ashcraft. He, he has the potential to be like the um, starter Emmanuel Classe because he's got a cutter with a high velocity and a very high ground ball rate. Yeah, I mean, I think I think an extension with him would probably just be like a simulation of Arb. Yeah, I can't imagine buying out that much free agency for him at this point. Yeah, they're not giving him like a ten year, no, two hundred million dollar deal at this point. Yeah, no, I think they're I think they're trying to make sure he never goes to arbitration, which it seems like that's kind of the Reds' model right now, and I kind of like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just get that get like, that out of know, the way. You have a guy that you'd like to keep on your team at least for the years that you already have control of him. Uh, and not have to worry about burning any bridges in that relationship in the meantime. Yeah. Sim the arb. Sim the arb years. Don't let them even think about it. Yeah. 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 Um. So yeah, that'll do it for this edition of Above Replacement Radio. We hope you enjoyed this one. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and want to watch our digital content, go over to the YouTube channel. It is called Above Replacement Radio. And if you're listening on YouTube and want to just check out the uh the pure audio form of the show go to the apple Podcasts and spotify uh streams it is called above replacement radio and if you want to follow us on social media follow me on twitter at chris underscore gianta follow daniel on both twitter and instagram at daniel underscore current and follow the show instagram at above replacement radio for all the show needs we hope you enjoyed this one and we hope to see you next time where we will be talking all the happenings in major league baseball once again see you then this conversation this conversation is over is over.